Section 5 of Astounding Stories, 2nd February, 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Wright. Astounding Stories, February 1930. Creatures of the Light by Sophie Wenzel Ellis. In a nightclub of many lights and much high pitched laughter, where he had come for an hour of forgetfulness and an execrable dinner, John Northwood was suddenly conscious that fate had begun shuffling the cards of his destiny for a dramatic game. First, he was aware that the singularly ugly and deformed man at the next table was gazing at him with an intense, almost excited scrutiny. But more disturbing than this was the scowl of hate on the face of another man, as handsome as this other was hideous, who sat in a far corner, hidden behind a broad column, with rude elbows on the table, gawking first at Northwood, and then at the deformed, almost hideous man. Northwood's blood chilled over the expression on the handsome, fair-haired stranger's perfectly carved face. If a figure in marble could display a fierce, unnatural passion, it would seem no more eldritch than the hate in the icy blue eyes. It was not a new experience for Northwood to be stared at. He was not merely a good-looking young fellow of twenty-five. He was scenery, magnificent and compelling. Furthermore, he had been in the public eye for years, first as a precocious child, and later as a brilliant young scientist. Yet for all his experience with hero-worshippers to put an adamantine crust on his sensibilities, he grew warm-eared under the gaze of these two strangers this hunchback with a face like a grotesque mask in a Greek play, this other who, even handsomer than himself, chilled the blood queerly with the cold perfection of his godlike masculine beauty. Northwood sensed something familiar about the hunchback. Somewhere he had seen that huge, round, intelligent face splattered with startling features. The very breadth of the man's massive brow was not altogether unknown to him, nor could Northwood look into the mournful, near-sighted black eyes without trying to recall when and where he had last seen them. But this other of the marble perfect nose and jaw, the blonde, thick-waved hair, was totally a stranger, whom Northwood fervently hoped he would never know too well. Trying to analyze the queer repugnance that he felt for this handsome, boldly staring fellow, Northwood decided, He's like a newly made wax figure endowed with life. Shivering over his own fantastic thought, he again glanced swiftly at the hunchback, who he noticed was playing with his coffee, evidently to prolong the meal. One year of calm-headed scientific teaching in a famous old eastern university, had not made him callous to mysteries. Thus, with a feeling of high adventure, he finished his supper and prepared to go. From the corner of his eye, he saw the hunchback leave his seat, while the handsome man behind the column rose furtively, as though he, too, intended to follow. Northwood was out in the dusky street about thirty seconds, when the hunchback came from the foyer. Without apparently noticing Northwood, he hailed a taxi. For a moment he stood still, waiting for the taxi to pull up at a curb, standing thus with the street light limning every unnatural angle of his twisted body and every queer abnormality of his huge features he looked almost repulsive. On his way to the taxi, his thick shoulder jostled the younger man. Northwood felt something strike his foot, and, stooping in the crowded street, picked up a black leather wallet. Wait! he shouted as the hunchback stepped into the waiting taxi. 
but the man did not falter. In a moment, Northwood lost sight of him as the taxi moved away. He debated with himself whether or not he should attempt to follow, and while he stood thus in indecision, the handsome stranger approached him. "'Good evening to you,' he said curtly. His rich, musical voice, for all its deepness, held a faint hint of the tremulous, bird-like notes heard in the voice of a young child who has not used his vocal cords long enough for them to have lost their exquisite newness. "'Good evening,' echoed Northwood, somewhat uncertainly. A sudden aura of repulsion swept coldly over him, seen close, with the brilliant light of the street directly on this too perfect face, the man was more sinister than in the café. Yet Northwood, struggling desperately for a reason to explain his violent dislike, could not discover why he shrank from this splendid creature, whose eyes and flesh had a new, fresh appearance rarely seen except in very young boys. "'I want what you picked up,' went on the stranger." "'It isn't yours,' Northwood flashed back. "'Ah, that effluvium of hatred which seemed to weave a tangible net around him. "'Nor is it yours. Give it to me. "'You're so insolent, aren't you?' "'If you don't give it to me, you'll be sorry.' The man did not raise his voice in anger, yet the words whipped Northwood with an almost physical violence. "'If he knew that I saw everything that happened in there,' that I am talking to you at this moment, he would tremble with fear. But you can't intimidate me. No. For a long moment, the cold blue eyes held his contemptuously. No, I can't frighten you, you worm of the black age. Before Northwood's horrified sight, he vanished, vanished as though he had turned suddenly to air and floated away. The street was not crowded at that time, and there was no pressing group of bodies to hide the splendid creature. Northwood gawked stupidly, mouth half open, eyes searching wildly everywhere. The man was gone. He had simply disappeared in this sane, electric-lighted street. Suddenly, close to Northwood's ear, grated a derisive laugh. "'I can't frighten you?' From nowhere came that singularly young old voice. As Northwood jerked his head around to meet blank space, a blow struck the corner of his mouth. He felt the warm blood run over his chin. I could take that wallet from you, worm, but you may keep it, and see me later. But remember this, the thing inside never will be yours. The words fell from empty air. For several minutes Northwood waited at the spot, expecting another demonstration of the abnormal, but nothing else occurred. At last, trembling violently, he wiped the thick moisture from his forehead and dabbed at the blood which he still felt on his chin. But when he looked at his handkerchief he muttered, "'Well, I'll be jiggered.' The handkerchief bore not the slightest trace of blood." Under the light in his bedroom, Northwood examined the wallet. It was made of alligator skin, clasped with a gold signet that bore the initial M. The first pocket was empty. The second yielded an object that sent a warm flush to his face. It was the photograph of a gloriously beautiful girl, so seductively lovely that the picture seemed almost to be alive. The short, curved upper lip, the full, delicately voluptuous lower, parted slightly in a smile that seemed to linger in every exquisite line of her face. She looked as though she had just spoken passionately, and the spirit of her words had inspired her sweet flesh and eyes. Northwood turned his head abruptly and groaned, "'Good heavens!' He had no right to palpitate over the picture of an unknown beauty. Only a month ago he had become engaged to a young woman whose mind was as brilliant as her face was plain. Always he had vowed that he would never marry a pretty girl, 
for he detested his own masculine beauty sincerely. He tried to grasp a mental picture of Mary Burns, who had never stirred in him the emotion that this smiling picture invoked, but gazing at the picture, he could not remember how his fiancée looked. Suddenly the picture fell from his fingers and dropped to the floor on its face, revealing an inscription on the back. In a bold, masculine hand he read, Your future wife. Some lucky fellow is headed for a life of bliss, was his jealous thought. He frowned at the beautiful face. What was this girl to that hideous hunchback? Why did the handsome stranger warn him? The thing inside never will be yours. Again he turned eagerly to the wallet. In the last flap he found something that gave him another surprise, a plain white card on which a name and address were written by the same hand that had penned the inscription on the picture. Emil Munson, Ph.D., forty-four and a half Indian Court. Emil Munson, the electrical wizard and distinguished scientific writer, friend of the professor of science at the university where Northwood was an assistant professor. Emil Munson, whom a week ago Northwood had yearned mightily to meet. Now Northwood knew why the hunchback's intelligent, ugly, familiar face was familiar to him. He had seen it pictured as often as enterprising news photographers could steal a likeness from the oversensitive scientist, who would never sit for a formal portrait. Even before Northwood had graduated from the university where he now taught, he had been avidly interested in Emil Munson's fantastic articles in scientific journals. Only a week ago, Professor Michael had come to him with the current issue of New Science shouting excitedly, "'Did you read this, John? This article? By Emil Munson?' His shaking, gnarled old fingers tapped the open page. Northwood seized the magazine and looked avidly at the title of the article. "'Creatures of the Light.' No, I haven't read it, he admitted. My magazine hasn't come yet. Run through it now briefly, will you? And note with special care the passages I have marked. In fact, you needn't bother with anything else just now. Read this, and this, and this. He pointed out penciled paragraphs. Northwood read. Man always has been, always will be, a creature of the light. He is forever reaching for some future point of perfected evolution which, even when his most remote ancestor was a fish creature composed of a few cells, was the guiding power that brought him up from the first stinking sea and caused him to create gods in his own image. In this yearning for perfection, which sets man apart from all other life, which made him man even in the rudimentary stages of his development. He was man when he wallowed in the slime of the new world and yearned for the air above. He will still be man when he has evolved into that glorious creature of the future whose body is deathless and whose mind rules the universe. Professor Michael, looking over Northwood's shoulder, interrupted the reading. Man always has been man, he droned emphatically. That's not original with friend Munson, of course. Yet it is a theory that he has not received sufficient investigation. He indicated another marked paragraph. Read this thoughtfully, John. It's the crux of Munson's thought, Northwood continued. Since the human body is chemical and electrical, Increased knowledge of its powers and limitations will enable us to work with nature in her sublime but infinitely slow processes of human evolution. We need not wait another fifty thousand years to be godlike creatures. 
Perhaps even now we may be standing at the beginning of the splendid bridge that will take us to that state of perfected evolution when we shall be creatures who have reached the light. Northwood looked questioningly at the professor. Queer, fantastic thing, isn't it? Professor Michael smoothed his thin, gray hair with his dried-out hand. Fantastic! His intellectual eyes behind the thick glasses sought the ceiling. Who can say? Haven't you ever wondered why all parents expect their children to be nearer perfection than themselves? And why is it a natural impulse for them to be willing to sacrifice themselves to better their offspring? He paused and moistened his pale, wrinkled lips. Instinct, Northwood! We creatures of the light know that our race shall reach that point of evolution when, as perfect creatures, we shall rule all matter and live forever. He punctuated the last words with blows on the table. Northwood laughed dryly. How many thousands of years are you looking forward, Professor? The Professor made an obscure noise that sounded like a smothered sniff. You and I shall never agree on the point that mental advancement may wipe out physical limitations in the human race, perhaps in a few hundred years. It seems as though your profound admiration for Dr. Munson would win you over to this pet theory. But what sane man can believe that even perfectly developed beings, through mental control, could overcome nature's fixed laws? We don't know. We don't know, the professor slapped the magazine with an emphatic hand. Emil Munson hasn't written this article for nothing. He's paving the way for some announcement that will startle the scientific world. I know him. In the same manner he gave out veiled hints of his various brilliant discoveries and inventions long before he offered them to the world. But Dr. Munson is an electrical wizard. He would not be delving seriously into the mysteries of evolution, would he? Why not? The professor's widened face screwed up wisely. A year ago, when he was back from one of those mysterious long excursions he takes in that weirdly different aircraft of his, about which he is so secretive, he told me that he was conducting experiments to prove his belief that the human being generates electric current, and that the electrical impulses in the brain set up radioactive waves that some day, among other miracles, will make thought communication possible. Perfect man, he says, will perform mental feats which will give him complete mental domination over the physical. Northwood finished reading and turned thoughtfully to the window. His profile in repose had the straight-nosed, full-lipped perfection of a Greek coin. Old, wizened Professor Michael, gazing at him covertly, smothered a sigh. "'I wish you knew, Dr. Munson,' he said. "'He, the ugliest man in the world, delights in physical perfection. He would revel in your splendid body and brilliant mind.' Northwood blushed hotly. "'You'll have to arrange a meeting between us.' I have, Professor's thin, dry lips pursed comically. He'll drop in to see you within a few days. And now John Northwood sat, holding Dr. Munson's card and the wallet, which the scientist had so mysteriously dropped at his feet. Here was high adventure, perhaps for which he had been singled out by the famous electrical wizard. While excitement mounted in his blood, Northwood again, examined the photograph. The girl's strange eyes, odd in expression rather than in size or shape, seemed to hold him. The young man's breath came quicker. It's a challenge, he said softly. It won't hurt to see what it's all about. His watch showed eleven o'clock. He would return the wallet that night. Into his coat pocket he slipped a revolver one sometimes needed weapons in Indian court. He took a taxi which soon turned from the well-lighted streets into a section where squalid houses crowded against each other 
and dirty children swarmed in the streets in their last games of the day. Indian court was little more than an alley, dark and evil-smelling. The chauffeur stopped at the entrance and said, "'If I drive in, I'll have to back out, sir. Number forty-four and a half is at the end house, facing the entrance.' "'You've been here before?' asked Northwood. "'Last week I drove the queerest bird here. "'A fella as good-looking as you, who had me follow the taxi, "'occupied by a hunchback with a face like old Nick.' "'The man hesitated and went on haltingly. "'It might sound goofy, mister, but there was something funny about my fare. "'He jumped out, asked me the charge.' and in the moment I glanced at my taximeter, he disappeared. Yes, sir, vanished, owing me four dollars six bits. It was almost ghost-like, mister. Northwood laughed nervously and dismissed him. He found his number and knocked at the dilapidated door. He heard a sudden movement in the lighted room beyond, and the door opened quickly. Dr. Munson faced him. I knew you'd come, he said, with a slight Teutonic accent. Often I'm not wrong in sizing up a man. Come in. Northwood cleared his throat awkwardly. You dropped your wallet at my feet, Dr. Munson. I tried to stop you before you got away, but I guess you did not hear me. He offered the wallet, but the hunchback waved it aside. A ruse, of course, he confessed. He just was my way of testing what your Professor Michael told about you, that you are extraordinarily intelligent, virile, and imaginative. Had you sent the violet to me, I should have sought elsewhere for my man. Come in. Northwood followed him into a living room, evidently recently furnished in a somewhat hurried manner. The furniture, although rich, was not placed to best advantage. The new rug was a trifle crooked on the floor, and the lampshades clashed in color with the other furnishings. Dr. Munson's intense eyes swept over Northwood's tall, slim body. Ah! You're a man, he said softly. You are what all men would be if we followed nature's plan, that only the fit shall survive. But... Modern science is permitting the unfit to live and to mix their defective beings with the developing race. His huge fist gesticulated madly. Fools! Fools! They need me and perfect men like you. Why? Because you can help me in my plan to populate the earth with a new race of godlike people. But don't question me too closely now. Even if I should explain, you would call me insane. But watch. Gradually, I shall unfold the mystery before you, so that you will believe. He reached for the wallet that Northwood still held up, opened it with a monstrous hand, and reached for the photograph. She shall bring you love. She's more beautiful than a poet's dream. A warm flush crept over the young man's face. I can easily understand, he said, how a man could love her, but for me she comes too late. Poof! Fiddlesticks! The scientist snapped his fingers. This girl was created for you. That other! You will forget her the moment you set eyes on the sweet flesh of this Otelia. She is an ori from paradise, a maiden of mosque and incense. He held the girl's photograph toward the young man. Keep it. She is yours, if you are strong enough to hold her. Northwood opened his card case and placed the picture inside, facing Mary's photograph. Again, the warning words of the mysterious stranger rang in his memory. The thing inside never will be yours. Where to, he said eagerly, and when do we start? 
to the new garden of Eden, said the scientist, with such a beatific smile that his face was less hideous. We start immediately. I have arranged with Professor Michael for you to go. Northwood followed Dr. Munson to the street and walked with him a few blocks to a garage where the scientist's motor car waited. The apartment in Indian Court is just a little eccentricity of mine, explained Dr. Munson. I need people in my work, people whom I must select through swift, sure tests. The apartment comes in handy, as tonight. Northwood scarcely noticed where they were going, or how long they had been on the way. He was vaguely aware that he had left the city behind, and were now passing through farms bathed in moonlight. At last they entered a path that led through a bit of woodland. For half a mile the path continued, and then ended at a small enclosed field. In the middle of this rested a queer aircraft. Northwood knew it was a flying machine only by the propellers mounted on the top of the huge ball-shaped body. There were no wings, no bird-like hull, no tail. It looks almost like a little world ready to fly off into space, he commented. It is just about that, the scientist's squat, bunched out body, settled squarely on long, thin, straddled legs, looked gnome light in the moonlight. One cannot copy flesh with steel and wood, but one can make metal perform magic of which flesh is not capable. My sonship is not a mechanical reproduction of a bird. It is... But climb in, young friend. Northwood followed Dr. Munson into the aircraft. The moment the scientist closed the metal door behind him, Northwood was instantly aware of some concealed horror that vibrated through his nerves. For one dreadful moment, he expected some terrific agent of the shadows that escaped the electric lights to leap upon him, and this was odd, for nothing could be saner than the globular interior of the aircraft, divided into four wedge-shaped apartments. Dr. Munson also paused at the door, puzzled, hesitant. "'Someone has been here,' he exclaimed. "'Look, Northwood, the bunk has been occupied. "'The one in this cabin I had set aside for you.' He pointed to the disarranged bunk, where the impression of a head could still be seen on a pillow. A tramp, perhaps. No. The door was locked, and as you saw, the fence around this field was protected with barbed wire. There's something wrong. I felt it on my trip here all the way, like someone watching me in the dark. And don't laugh. I have stopped laughing at all things that seem unnatural. You don't know what is natural. Northwood shivered. Maybe someone is concealed about the ship. Impossible. Me, I thought so too. But I looked and looked, and there was nothing. All evening Northwood had burned to tell the scientist about the handsome stranger in the Mad Hatter Club but even now he shrank from saying that a man had vanished before his eyes. Dr. Munson was working with a succession of buttons and levers. There was a slight jerk, and then the strange craft shot up, straight as a bullet from a gun, with scarcely a sound other than a continuous whistle. The vertical rising aircraft perfected, explained Dr. Munson. But what would you think— if I told you that there is not an ounce of gasoline in our heavier-than aircraft, I shouldn't be surprised. An electrical genius would seek for a less obsolete source of power. In the bright flare of the electric lights, the scientist's ugly face flushed. The man who harnesses the sun rules the world. He can make the desert places bloom. The frozen poles balmy and verdant. You, John Northwood, 
are one of very few to fly in a machine operated solely by electrical energy from the sun's rays. Are you telling me that this airship is operated with power from the sun? Yeah, and I cannot take the credit for its invention, he sighed. The dream was mine, but a greater brain developed it. A brain that may be greater than I suspect. His face grew suddenly graver. A little later, Northwood said, It seems that we must be making fabulous speed. Perhaps, Dr. Munson worked with the controls. Here, I've cut her down to the average speed of the ordinary airplane. Now you can see a bit of the night scenery. Northwood peeped out the thick glass porthole. Far below, he saw two tiny streaks of light, one smooth and stationary, the other wavering as though it were a reflection in the water. That can't be a lighthouse, he cried. The scientist glanced out. It is. We're approaching the Florida Keys. Impossible! We've been traveling less than an hour. But, my young friend, do you realize that my sunship has a speed of over 1,000 miles an hour? How much over, I dare not tell you. Throughout the night, Northwood sat beside Dr. Munson, watching his deft fingers control the simple-looking buttons and levers. So fast was their flight now that, through the portholes, sky and earth looked the same, dark gray films of emptiness. The continuous weird whistle from the hidden mechanism of the sunship was like the drone of a monster insect monotonous and soporific during the long intervals when the scientist was too busy with his controls to engage in conversation. For some reason that he could not explain, Northwood had an aversion to going into the sleeping apartment behind the control room. Then, towards morning, when the suddenly falling temperature struck a biting chill throughout the sunship, Northwood, going into the cabin for fur coats, discovered why his mind and body shrank in horror from the cabin. After he had procured the fur coats from a closet, he paused a moment, in the privacy of the cabin, to look at Athalia's picture. Every nerve in his body leaped to meet the magnetism of her beautiful eyes. Never had Mary Burns stirred emotion like this in him. He hung over Mary's picture, wistfully hoping almost prayerfully that he could react to her as he did to Athalia. But her pale, over-intellectual face left him cold. Cad, he ground out between his teeth. Forgetting her so soon. The two pictures were lying side by side on a little table. Suddenly an obscure noise in the room caught his attention. It was more vibration than noise, for small sounds could scarcely be heard above the whistle of the sunship. A slight compression of the air against his neck gave him the eerie feeling that someone was standing close behind him. He wheeled and looked over his shoulder. Half ashamed of his startled gesture, he again turned to his pictures. Then a sharp cry broke from him. Athalia's picture was gone. He searched for it everywhere in the room, in his own pockets, under the furniture. It was nowhere to be found. In sudden, overpowering horror, he seized the fur coats and returned to the control room. Dr. Munson was changing the speed. Look out the window, he called to Northwood. The young man looked and started violently. Day had come, and now that the sunship was flying at a moderate speed, the ocean beneath was plainly visible, and its entire surface was covered with broken flows of ice and small, ragged icebergs. He seized a telescope and focused it below. A typical polar scene met his eyes. Penguins strutted about on cakes of ice, a whale blowing in the icy water. A part of the Antarctic that has never been explored, said Dr. Munson. And there! 
just drawing on the horizon is the great ice barrier his characteristic smile lighted the morose black eyes i am enough of the dramatist to wish you to be impressed with what i shall show you within less than an hour accordingly i shall make a landing and let you feel polar ice under your feet after less than a minute's search dr munson found a suitable place on the ice for a landing and with a few deft manipulations of the controls brought the sun ship swooping down like an eagle on its prey for a long moment after the scientist had stepped out on the ice northwood paused at the door his feet were chained by a strange reluctance to enter this white dead wilderness of ice but dr munson's impatient ready drew from him one last glance at the cosy interior of the sunship before he too went out into the frozen stillness they left the sunship resting on the ice like a fallen silver moon while they wandered to the edge of the barrier and looked at the gray narrow stretch of sea between the ice pack and the high cliffs of the barrier the sun of the commencing six months antarctic day was a low cold ball whose slanted rays struck the ice with blinding whiteness there were constant falls of ice from the barrier which thundered into the ocean amid great clouds of ice smoke that lingered like wraiths around the edge it was a scene of loneliness and waiting death what's that exclaimed the scientist suddenly out of the white silence shrilled a low whistle a familiar whistle both men wheeled toward the sunship before their horrified eyes the great sphere jerked and glided up and swerved into the heavens up it soared then gaining speed it swung into the blue distance until in a moment it was a tiny star that flickered out even as they watched both men screamed and cursed and flung up their arms despairingly a penguin attracted by their cries waddled solemnly over to them and regarded them with manlike curiosity stranded in the coldest spot on earth groaned the scientist why did it start itself dr munson northwood narrowed his eyes as he spoke it didn't the scientist's huge face red from cold quivered with helpless rage human hands started it what whose hands Ach! do i know his teutonic accent grew more pronounced as it always did when he was under emotional stress somebody whose brain is better than mine somebody who found a way to hide away from our eyes Ach, god don't let me think his great head sank between his shoulders giving him in his fur suit the grotesque appearance of a friendly brown bear dr munson said northwood suddenly did you have an enemy a man with the face and body of a pagan god a great blond creature with eyes as cold and cruel as the ice under your feet wait the huge round head jerked up how do you know about autumn you have not seen him won't see him until we arrive in our destination but i have seen him he was sitting not thirty feet from you in the mad hatter's club last night didn't you know he followed me to the street spoke to me and then northwood stopped how could he let the insane words pass his lips then what speak up northwood laughed nervously it sounds foolish but i saw him vanish like that Ach, God! all the ruddy color drained from the scientist's face as though talking to himself he continued then it is true as he said he has crossed the bridge he has reached the light and now he comes to see the world he will conquer came unseen when i refused my permission he was silent for a long time pondering then he turned passionately to northwood john northwood cue me 
I have brought a new horror to, into the world. From the unborn future, I have snatched a creature who has reached the light too soon. Kill me. He bowed his great shaggy head. What do you mean, Dr. Munson? That this atom has arrived at a point in evolution beyond this age? Yes, think of it. I vision godlike creatures with the souls of gods. But, Evan, help us. Man always will be men. Always will lust for conquest. You and I, Northwood, and all others are barbarians to Adam. He and his kind will do what men always do to barbarians, conquer and kill. Are there more like him? Northwood struggled with a smile of unbelief. I don't know. I did not know that Adam had reached a point so near the ultimate. But you have seen. Already he is able to set aside what we call natural laws. Northwood looked at the scientist closely. The man was surely mad. Mad in this desert of white death. Come, he said cheerfully. Let's build an Eskimo snow house. We can live on penguins for days, and who knows what may rescue us. For three hours the two worked at cutting ice blocks. With snow for mortar, they built a crude shelter which enabled them to rest out of the cold breath of the spiral polar winds that blew from the south. Dr. Munson was sitting at the door of their hut, moodily pulling at his strong black pipe. As though a fit had seized him, he leaped up and let his pipe fall to the ice. Luke, he shouted. The sun chip. It seemed but a moment before the tiny speck on the horizon had swept overhead, a silver comet on the grayish-blue polar sky. In another moment it had swooped down, eagle-wise, scarcely fifty feet from the ice hut. Dr. Munson and Northwood ran forward. From the metal sphere stepped the stranger of the Mad Hatter Club. His tall, straight form, erect and slim, swung toward them over the ice. Adam! shouted Dr. Munson. What does this mean? How dare you? Adam's laugh was like the happy demonstration of a boy. So, you think you are still master? You think I return because I reverenced you yet? Hate shot viciously through the freezing blue eyes. You worm of the Black Age! Northwood shuddered. He had heard those strange words addressed to himself scarcely more than twelve hours ago. Adam was still speaking. With a thought I could annihilate you where you are standing. But I have use for you. Get in. He swept his hand to the sunship. Both men hesitated. Then Northwood strode forward until he was within three feet of Adam. They stood thus, eyeing each other, two splendid beings, one blonde as a Viking, the other dark and vital. "'Just what is your game?' demanded Northwood. The icy eyes shot forth a gleam like lightning. I needn't tell you, of course, but I may as well let you suffer over the knowledge. He curled his lips with superb scorn. I have one human weakness. I want Athalia. The icy eyes warmed for a fleeting second. She is anticipating her meeting with you. Bah! The taste of these women of the Black Age. I could kill you, of course but that would only inflame her. And so I take you to her, thrust you down her throat. When she sees you, she will fly to me. He spread his magnificent chest. Adam! Dr. Munson's face was dark with anger. What of Eve? Who are you to question my actions? What a fool you were to let me, whom you forced into life thousands of years too soon, grow more powerful than you. Before I am through with 
all of you petty creatures of the black age you will call me more terrible than your jehovah for see what you have called forth from unborn time he vanished before the startled men could recover from the shock of it the vibrant too new voice went on i am sorry for you munson because like you i need specimens for my experiments what a splendid specimen you will be his laugh was ugly with significance get in worms unseen hands cuffed and pushed them into the sunship inside dr munson stumbled to the control room white and drawn of face, his great brain seemingly paralyzed by the catastrophe. "'You needn't attempt tricks,' went on the voice. "'I am watching you both. You cannot even hide your thoughts from me.' And thus began the strange continuation of the journey. Not once in that wild half-hour's rush over the polar ice clouds did they see Adam." They saw and heard only the weird signs of his presence. A puffing cigar hanging in mid-air, a glass of water swinging to unseen lips, a ghostly voice hurling threats and insults at them. Once the scientist whispered, Don't cross him. It is useless. John Northwood, you'll have to fight a demagogue for your woman. Because of the terrific speed of the sunship, Northwood could distinguish nothing of the topographical details below. At the end of half an hour, the scientist slowed enough to point out a tall range of snow-covered mountains, over which hovered a play of colored lights like the Aurora Australis. "'Behind those mountains,' he said, "'is our destination.' Almost in a moment, the sunship had soared over the peaks. Dr. Munson kept the speed low enough for Northwood to see the splendid view below. In the giant cup formed by the encircling mountain range was a green valley of tropical luxuriance. Stretches of dense forests swept half up the mountains and filled the valley cup with tangled verdure. In the center, surrounded by a broad field and a narrow ring of woods, towered a group of buildings from the largest which was circular came the aurora-like radiance that formed an umbrella of light over the entire valley do i guess right said northwood that the light is responsible for this oasis in the ice yeah said dr munson in your american slang it is canned sunshine containing an overabundance of certain rays, especially the life ray, which I have isolated, he smiled proudly. You needn't look startled, my friend. Some of the most common things store sunlight. On very dark nights, if you have sharp eyes, you can see the radiance given off by certain flowers, which many naturalists say is trapped sunshine the vermilion nasturtiums and the marigold opened for me the way to hold sunshine against the long polar night for they taught me how to apply the einstein theory of bent light stated simply during the polar night when the sun is hidden over the rim of the world we steal some of his rays during the polar day, we concentrate the light. But could stored sunshine alone give enough warmth for the luxuriant growth of those jungles? An overabundance of the life ray is responsible for the miraculous growth of all life in New Eden. The life ray is nature's most powerful force. Yet nature is often niggardly and paradoxical in her use of her powers. In New Eden, we have forced the powers of creation to take ascendancy over the powers of destruction. At Northwood's sudden start, the scientist laughed and continued, Is it not a pity 
that nature, left alone, requires twenty years to make a man who begins to die in another ten years? Such waste is not tolerated in New Eden. Their supermen are younger than babies, and— Come, worms, let's stand. It was Adam's voice. Suddenly he materialized a blond god whose eyes and flesh were too new. They were in a world of golden skylight, warmth, and tropical vegetation. The field on which they had landed was covered with a velvety green growth of very soft, fine-bladed grass, sprinkled with tiny, star-shaped blue flowers. A balmy, sweet-scented wind, downy as the breeze of a dream, blew gently along the grass and tingled against Northwood's skin refreshingly. Almost instantly he had the sensation of perfect well-being, and this feeling of physical perfection was part of the ecstasy that seemed to pervade the entire valley. Grass and breeze and golden skylight were saturated with a strange ether of joyousness. At one end of the field was a dense jungle, cut through by a road that led to the towering buildings, from which, while above in the sunship, they had seen the golden light issue. From the jungle road came a man and a woman, large, handsome people, whose flesh and eyes had the sinister newness of Adam's. Even before they came close enough to speak, Northwood was aware that while they seemed of Adam's breed, they were yet unlike him. The difference was psychical rather than physical. They lacked the aura of hate and horror that surrounded Adam. The woman drew Adam's head down and kissed him affectionately on both cheeks. Adam, from his towering height, patted her shoulder impatiently and said, "'Run on back to the laboratory, Grandmother. We're following soon. You have some new human embryos, I believe you told me this morning.' Four fine specimens, two of them being your sister's twins.' "'Splendid! I was sure that creation had stopped with my generation. I must see them.' He turned to the scientist and Northwood. "'You needn't try to leave this spot. Of course I shall know instantly, and deal with you in my own way. Wait here.' He strode over the emerald grass on the heels of the woman. Northwood asked, "'Why does he call that girl grandmother?' "'Because she is his ancestress,' he stirred uneasily. "'She is of the first generation brought forth in the laboratory, "'and is no different from you or I, "'except that at the age of five years "'she is the ancestress of twenty generations.' "'My God!' muttered Northwood. "'Don't start being horrified, my friend. Forget about so-called natural laws while you are in New Eden. Remember, here we have isolated the life-ray. But look, here comes your Athelia. Northwood gazed covertly at the beautiful girl approaching them with a rarely graceful walk. She was tall, slender, round-bosomed, narrow-hipped, and she held her lovely body in the erect poise of splendid health. Northwood had a confused realization of uncovered bronzy hair drawn to the back of a white neck in a bunch of short curls, of immense soft black eyes, lips the color of blood, and delicate, plump flesh on which the golden skylight lingered graciously. He was instantly glad to see that while she possessed the freshness of young girlhood, her skin and eyes did not have that horrible newness of Adam's. When she was still twenty feet distant, Northwood met her eyes and she smiled shyly. The rich red blood ran through her face, and he too flushed. She went to Dr. Munson and placed her hands on his thick shoulders, kissed him affectionately. "'I've been worried about you, Daddy Munson. 
her rich contralto voice matched her exotic beauty. Since you and Adam had that quarrel the day you left, I did not see him until this morning, when he landed the sunship alone. And you pleaded with him to return for us? Yes, her eyes drooped, and a hot flush swept over her face. Dr. Munson smiled. But I am back now, Athelia, and I've brought someone whom I hope you will be glad to know. Reaching for her hand, he placed it simply in Northwood's. This is John, Athelia. Isn't he handsomer than the pictures of him which I television to you? God bless both of you. He walked ahead and turned his back. A magical half-hour followed for Northwood and Athalia. The girl told him of her past life, how Dr. Munson had discovered her one year ago working in a New York sweatshop, half-dead from consumption. Without friends, she was eager to follow the scientist to New Eden, where he promised she would recover her health immediately. "'And he was right, John,' she said shyly. "'The life ray, that marvelous energy ray, which penetrates to the utmost depths of earth and ocean, giving to the cells of all living bodies the power to grow and remain animate, has been concentrated by Dr. Munson in his stored sunshine. The life ray healed me almost immediately. Northwood looked down at the glorious girl beside him, whose eyes already fluttered away from his like shy black butterflies. Suddenly, he squeezed the soft hand in his and said passionately, Athalia, because Adam wants you and will get you if he can, let us set aside all the artificialities of civilization. I have loved you madly ever since I saw your picture. If you can say the same to me, it will give me courage to face what I know lies before me. Athalia, her face suddenly tender, came closer to him. John Northwood, I love you. Her red lips came temptingly close, but before he could touch them, Adam suddenly pushed his body between them and Athalia. Adam was pale, and all the iciness was gone from his blue eyes, which were deep and dark and very human. He looked down at Athalia and she looked up at him, two handsome specimens of perfect manhood and womanhood. Fast work, Athalia. The new vibrant voice was strained. I was hoping you would be disappointed in him, especially after having been wooed by me this morning. I could take care of you, if I wished, of course. But I prefer to win you in the ancient manner. Dismiss him. He jerked his thumb over his shoulder in Northwood's direction. Athalia flushed vividly and looked at him almost compassionately. I'm not great enough for you, Adam. I dare not love you. Adam laughed, and still oblivious of Northwood and Dr. Munson, folded his arms over his breast. With the golden skylight on his burnished hair, he was a valiant, magnificent spectacle. Since the beginning of time, gods and archangels have looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair. Mate with me, Athalia, and I, fifty thousand years beyond the creature Munson has selected for you, will make you as I am, the deathless overlord of life and all nature. He drew her hand to his bosom. For one dark moment, Northwood felt himself seared by jealousy, for through the plump, sweet flesh of Athalia's face he saw the red blood leap again. How could she withhold herself from this splendid superman? But her answer, given with faltering voice, was the old, simple one. I have promised him, Adam, I love him. Tears trembled on her thick lashes. So, I cannot get you in the ancient manner. Now I'll use my own. He seized her in his arms, crushed her against him, 
and laughing over her head at Northwood, bent his glistening head and kissed her on the mouth. There was a blinding flash of blue electric sparks and nothing else. Both Adam and Athalia had vanished. End of Section 5